Hi folks, this is Code That Can't Fail, backed by Cassandra. My name is Lauren, and I'm a developer relations engineer at Temporal. I'm going to introduce a concept called durable execution, and then I'll explain how we designed a system that provides durable execution. Finally, I'll share a few learnings we've had working with Cassandra at scale. Part one, durable execution. So what even is code that can't fail? Now, I don't mean expected errors, like your code charges a card and gets a card expired error. What I mean is that you can write a function that will not fail to complete executing. It is guaranteed to finish running. Now you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Of course functions finish executing. That's how running code works. But there are a number of different cases in which your code might fail to complete. The process could crash. Maybe you divide it by zero. The process could be killed by the OS. Maybe it's out of memory. The machine could lose power. You could deploy a new version of your code. And while usually you'd set a, up a graceful shutdown for the old processes, they may be doing something longer than the grace period, like a sleep statement for one hour. And that would get interrupted by the forced shutdown after, say, a five minute grace period. The final reason is transient failures, like temporarily unable to reach a downstream service. Now, of course, you could catch and handle this type of error and retry with exponential backoff, but A, that can be a lot of code to write everywhere you hit the network, and B, if you, the retries go on for long enough, you'll go past the redeployment graceful shutdown window and get killed and lose the state of what you were trying to do. Durable ex execution takes care of all of these failures. It runs your code in a way that persists each step taken so that in the event of a failure, it can read from uh, read the execution history from disk and continue executing your function from the same place with the call stack and local variables intact. So this is great for any application that needs a high level of reliability and correctness, applications that already are or should be manually checkpointing progress, saving state to the database after each step to ensure the ability to recover from execution getting interrupted. These applications can throw away their manual database updates and state machine code and instead write a durable function with automatically persisted steps and recovery. But maybe you're like, my application doesn't need that level of reliability. I never have long sleeps and I already have retry code and it's okay if there's a restart on rare occasion and a retry gets interrupted and lost. It's a bug and we'll either lose data or end up in inconsistent data. Um, but if it happens once in a blue moon, that's fine. Uh, support can handle it. My answer to that is if you have a decent sized load, even with an application with a uh, normal amount of complexity in terms of downstream services and third party APIs, you're going to have a significant amount of dropped work. So you're going to need to persist retry information and timers and have a pool of workers that pick up dropped work. And you're, you need to do that at every service boundary and for every important third party API. That's a lot of code to write, debug, and maintain. That's why people do choreography using a message bus to coordinate between services or orchestration, where there's a central orchestrator deciding which services to call. Choreography still uh, involves a lot of code and gets really complex to reason about and debug when things go wrong. In the Microservices Patterns book, Chris Richardson recommends using orchestration for all but the simplest of use cases. And you can think of durable execution as like a developer-friendly version of orchestration. So if your work is important and you don't want to drop it, you can either write and maintain a lot of code to try and make sure that it's not dropped, or you can use durable execution and code at a higher level of, of abstraction where you don't have to care about crashes and deployments and retries and even about saving state. Not only is durable execution taking care of things you used to have to do manually, but it opens up new ways of programming. You can sleep for 30 days, and not only will the function reliably go to the next line of code after 30 days passes, but you also won't be taking up resources during those 30 days because the system will know the function isn't in use, kill it in order to free up resources for active functions, and when 30 days comes around, um, recover the function to the correct state. So you could easily code a subscription charging the customer every 30 days in a loop, and that will run reliably. Since these functions are potentially long running, you may want to query, query them for their state or send them instructions. So durable functions provide mechanisms to receive and respond to RPCs. For instance, on Amazon, if there's a 30 minute cancellation window on each order, if that was implemented with a durable function, you would start the function at order time, the function would reserve the item, sleep for 30 minutes, and if it received an RPC that said cancel before then, it would free up that inventory, send a cancellation successful email, and return. Durable functions can also be indefinitely long running. For example, you could have a customer function that runs forever and implements your customer loyalty program. Whenever the customer makes a purchase, you send that customer's durable function an RPC with the purchase info, and that function adds uh, to the customer's loyalty points and decides whether and, and when to send them an email, maybe with a coupon or an encouragement to hit the next loyalty level. 
Finally, if you have a function that can last forever and can't fail, and that can respond to RPCs, you no longer need a database. In the last example, when the customer logs into their account to view their loyalty points, we don't need to look it up in a database. Instead, we send a get points RPC to the function, and it responds with the number of points. To more concretely show what I'm talking about, I'll look at a couple examples. First, here's the subscription implemented as a durable function. It takes a user object and an amount to charge. It starts out with canceled false, sets up a handler for an RPC called cancel, which sets cancel to true and sends a confirmation email. Then it loops, while not canceled, charge the user and sleep 30 days. So the function will wake up when the sleep timer goes off or when it receives a cancel RPC. And otherwise it won't take up resources. Also, both the send email and charge functions will automatically retry on failures, like our email service is down or we can't reach Stripe. Now here is the loyalty program example. When a user signs up, you call the function with the user object and they start with zero points. Whenever the user makes a purchase, we send a notify purchase RPC to the function and it adds to the points total and decides whether to send the user a coupon. Whenever the user views their profile, we send a get points RPC to the function, which returns the points total. Finally, the function needs to not return at the end so that it stays running. So we wait for a promise that never resolves. So that's a, a whole loyalty program. It's pretty basic, but it's reliable, scalable, and durable. We don't need to save the point total to a database. We can trust that the local variable will always be there and accurate. And that's durable execution. It's running functions in a way that is process independent. They survive process death, and long running functions are intentionally run by different processes over time. It automatically retries any functions that might have transient failures. You can sleep for arbitrary periods of time. You can send messages to the function and receive responses. Your functions can last indefinitely long, and you can treat your local variables as durable state. Here are some of the major systems that support durable execution. At the bottom is Temporal, where I work. Our co-founders, Maxime and Summer, launched AWS Simple Workflow Service in 2012 the first durable execution system. It was developed after Amazon switched to microservices, ran into the problems of communicating between them with messages, i.e. event-driven architecture and choreography, and wanted a better way of coordinating. Summer went on to Microsoft to, and built a Azure Durable Task Framework, which became so popular that it was adapted by Azure Durable Functions. Summer and Maxime got back together at Uber, where they created Cadence in 2016 which is used by Uber Engineering to coordinate across uh, uh, over a thousand microservices and was adopted by a number of other companies as well. They left Uber in 2019 and forked Cadence to start the Temporal project and company in order to improve the software and bring it to more developers. And we now have 180 employees working on it, including me. And here are some of the companies that use Temporal, including Stripe, Netflix, Box, and Datadog. Every Coinbase transaction, every Snap story, every Airbnb booking is a durable function. Now that we have a better sense of what durable execution is, let's get into how Temporal implements a system that provides durable execution. At a high level, there are three parts to the system. There's a client library that uses start durable functions or stop them or send RPCs to them. It talks via gRPC to the server, which saves the progress of the function to the database. There's a worker, which uses one of our language runtimes. We support Go, Java, Python, Node, PHP, and .NET. And the worker has your code. The workers are polling the server for tasks, and when they, get it, when they get a task, they run your code, like calling a durable function or calling a function's RPC handler. Then the worker sends the server the results of running the code. For application developers writing durable functions, you just write your functions, uh, start, uh, run them with our worker library, and, and start them with the client library. The gRPC messages sent to the server are an implementation detail that you don't need to think about. It. But since this is a talk about how Temporal uses Cassandra, we need to talk about how it works under the hood. Let's look at a concrete example for uh, of, of the communications. We can start the subscription function we saw earlier by using the client to send the server a start function message. The server saves the request in the database and replies that it has received and accepted the request. The server creates a start function task for the worker. The worker pulls and receives the task and calls the function. The function initializes a variable, sets up an RPC handler, enters the loop, and hits the line await charge. That's the result of executing the start function task. And at this point, the worker sends that result to the server. The fact that that start um, oh, await charge is being called. Um, the worker is saying the next step of running the subscription function is calling this charge function. Now let's look inside the server to see how it handles receiving the next step. Inside the server component are a few different services and a couple data stores. 
The front end service receives the next step from the worker along with its ID. Well, the ID of this instance of the subscription function. Each instance has an ID that is unique among all running functions, and it's provided by the client at start time. We hash the ID to determine which host the function belongs to. In this case, function ID 5 belongs to host B, so that's where the front end service forwards the request to. Each host has a database partition or shard. We support MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, and Cassandra, but it's a very write-heavy load since each step of each function you run in production is written to the database, and you can scale that write load much higher with Cassandra, so we use Cassandra for our cloud service. Our cloud service is a hosted version of the server, but it's open source and many companies host it themselves. Uh, the cloud pitch is that you'll save money, uh, time, and, and thus money, uh, as well as peace of mind if the experts host it and maintain it for you. Now let's zoom in on just host B and partition B. When host B gets the message to call charge, it needs to do three things. Update the state of the function, add a charge task to the queue so that a worker can pick it up and execute it, and add a timeout. There are many types of timeouts that might be set. In this case, uh, it might be the maximum length of time the charge function can be tried and retried before we consider it permanently failed, at which point uh, that line of code in the subscription function would throw an error. It's important that all three things um, are done together atomically because otherwise you'll run into various sorts of race conditions and inconsistencies. Like if you update state first and then fail to add the task to the queue, then the system will think there's a task that's not there. Or if you add to the queue first, if the update is slow, the task might be completed before the update goes through, uh, which was the cause of a 28-day outage at Azure uh, between Azure Service Bus and Cosmos DB. Uh, so, so we use a single partition batch uh, statement to get atomicity and, and isolation. In this case, we have four statements in the batch. First, we assert this host still owns this partition, set partition ID to B if partition ID is B. Uh, then update the function state if we have the correct state version number. Then add the charge task and the timeout. If any of the statements fail, none of them will be committed. An issue with having the tasks on each partition is query performance. With Cassandra, I think of your schema design as following your query patterns versus relational where you can, just to an extent, start with the schema and query arbitrarily. So when we're thinking of the query, give me the next task on the payments queue we would need to check all of the partitions uh, because they're partitioned by function ID, not by queue name, and that's not scalable. So we have a separate table called tasks on the right, partitioned by queue name, and a separate service for responding to uh, queue queries. And we have a service that moves task, um, task from each functions table partition on the left to the tasks table on the right, and it takes care of retrying and deduping. This is the transactional outbox pattern, and the, the queues on the left are also called transfer queues. Also, a single queue can have a uh, load higher than a single host can handle. So in reality, we shard the hosts on the right further beyond just the queue name. So now when a worker asks the front-end service for new work on the payments task queue, it will get forwarded to host one, which will take the charge task from, part, uh, to, from partition one. When, uh, worker, when the worker receives the charge task, it will call the charge function. If the function fails, the worker will report that back to the server. If it's something transient like a network error, the server will, will schedule the same task for a future time. If it's something permanent like a card expired error, the server will record that result and put a task on the queue to activate the subscription function, which will throw from the await charge line of code. If the charge succeeds, the server will record the result and activate the subscription function, passing the result. Uh, that's as far as I'll go into Temporal's architecture. Uh, for the next section, I talk to one of our engineers that has the most experience with Cassandra to get a few quick things we've learned from using Cassandra uh, a lot under high load. The first thing is that we have a lot of queues. And as an old data stacks blog post says, queues are an anti-pattern in Cassandra. A simple example is if we have a tasks table with queue name and queue dat and task info, if we insert 10,000 tasks onto the payments queue and then delete all but the most recent, there will be 9,999 tombstones, which by default will stick around for their 10-day garbage collection grace period. If we do the query on the right, select a single task from the payments queue, then Cassandra will have to go through all the tombstones before finding the most recently inserted task, and that could take uh, 300 milliseconds. The solution is to avoid most or all of these tombstones by adding to the where clause to tell Cassandra where to start scanning. And here's a list, uh, here's a link to the anti-pattern blog post and an example in our code of, of avoiding scanning tombstones. Here are some miscellaneous things we found working with Cassandra. Generally, Cassandra is a great fit for write heavy workloads and especially nice for append only tables. We try to avoid lightweight transactions. 
Beyond the forex latency of Paxos for phase, phase commit, there's also the potential of contention during two of the phases. We wound up implementing a client-side in-memory lock to avoid sending concurrent lightweight transactions. There's also the need, if you use lightweight transactions to insert rows, to only use lightweight transactions for reading and writing on that table. We try to avoid secondary indexes or materialize views and use Elasticsearch for searching. This decision came out of a outage several years ago with high load on the secondary index. It's really possible that particular issue has been fixed since then. We also try to avoid large partitions. Uh, while Cassandra is great for write heavy workloads, it's still the bottleneck for us uh, in terms of supporting higher throughput. And we had a customer with a use case that was going to exceed our capacity to scale with Cassandra. So we had to reduce the amount that we write to Cassandra while still recording uh, on a disk somewhere every step all the durable functions that our running take. So we added a write ahead log between our server and Cassandra. Instead of writing every update to Cassandra, we write everything to the wall and periodically flush wall updates to Cassandra. This results in significantly lower load on Cassandra, which means increased throughput. Walls are cheaper to also cheaper, cheaper to write to, uh, which resulted in cost savings, and they're faster to write to, which means we're able to respond to user requests faster and support lower latency use cases. It currently takes us 90 milliseconds uh, P90 to start a durable function, which involves two Cassandra operations in series. We're planning on replacing that with a couple of wall writes in parallel, which take an average of six milliseconds and are hoping to get a 10 millisecond P90. Wall writes also have less variability in latency compared to Cassandra operations, so P90 and P99 are closer to the average. Which makes sense, it's, it's simpler and faster to write to a few disks than a general purpose database can execute operations. We also found that the new system increased reliability. We now have fewer incidents and better time to recover. The big caveat to doing this is complexity. It's a lot to design and code and get correct and bug free. Whether you can do it and how you implement it depends a lot on your use case. And there are a lot of things to build, like the recovery process when the service that's writing to the wall restarts. It can't just read from Cassandra. It needs to read everything from the wall that hasn't been flushed the database in order to rebuild in memory the correct state. We also have a backup wall that we can swap to if the primary goes down. And there are many other details. You're effectively building a new database on top of Cassandra, so it's not something I'd recommend most do. Uh, but it's an interesting spot we've gotten to due to unusually high throughput requirements. To recap, we learned what durable execution is, how it's programming at a higher level of, of abstraction, where a number of uh, different distributed systems concerns are taken care of automatically for you. We also took a look at um, part of the internals of how that's implemented and shared a few learnings from our time with Cassandra. I'll end with something we like to say, which is distributed systems should hold you up, not hold you back. Durable execution can support you in building more reliable systems with a better developer experience. If you'd like to learn more, our website is temporal.io. I'm Lauren, S uh, Lauren DSR on X and happy to answer any questions you have. And these slides are available at t.mp slash can't fail Cassandra. Thanks a lot.